differential diagnosis of spinal stenosis. This is the list of conditions that its presentation may mimic spinal stenosis. Metastatic disease, hip disease, peripheral neuropathy, disc herniation, and vascular disease and vascular claudication. In metastatic disease of the spine, there are some warning signs, like the patient have a history of cancer, have weight loss, patient is over the age of 50, patient is treated for low back pain and the treatment is not working, pain at rest and at night, and the symptoms are non-specific. Hip disease can be excluded by history and examination. Although hip disease and lumbar stenosis symptoms can coexist and overlap, we must determine where the pain comes from. Is it coming from the hip or is it coming from the spine? Patient may have symptoms of both conditions and the physical exam may actually indicate the patient have both hip arthritis and lumbar stenosis. An injection in the hip is probably easier than injecting the spine and see the result. It is important to have at least a few months between injection of the hip and doing a total hip replacement to minimize the incidence of infection. The hip spine syndrome has recently been identified and the distinction between both should be clarified and the primary pain generator should be identified and injection may help to do that. Some patients got worse after total hip replacement, either they got worsening of the low back pain or they got a foot drop. Symptoms from the other pain generator also may get worse due to increased activity of the patient. The hip spine syndrome refers to the existence of osteoarthritis of the hip and degenerative stenosis of the lumbar spine. Both are degenerative condition and can result in buttock pain, lateral hip, and leg pain and limited walking ability. The diagnosis of the primary source of pain in these two conditions may be challenging and may be overlooked because they have overlapping presentations and symptoms. Although it is possible to differentiate the two conditions based on the clinical examination, sometimes it is not easy. There is usually a delay in the diagnosis and treatment. You need to think about the association of these two conditions and treating both conditions may be necessary to achieve satisfactory resolution of the patient pain. Hip pain can arise from the structures that are within the hip joint or from the structures that are around the hip joint. When the patient states that their hip hurts, it does not mean that the pain is coming from the hip joint itself. It is important to ask the patient to point to the site of the hip pain because hip pain can be in the groin, in the lateral aspect of the hip, in the posterior aspect of the hip, or it can be far posterior, near the spine and the sacroiliac joint. Peripheral neuropathy and lumbar stenosis both may coexist together. The EMG will help to differentiate between peripheral neuropathy and lumbar stenosis. Burning pain in both feet at night is probably a peripheral neuropathy and it is not a lumbar stenosis. Pain on one leg is worse by walking and is relieved by sitting down. That comes from lumbar stenosis or radiculopathy. Sensory exam is very important in this condition. The aim of the sensory testing is to identify if there is a dermatomal pattern of sensory distribution 
which will suggest a spinal root problem or a possible glove and the stocking distribution, which will suggest a neuropathy. Another differentiation is between lumbar stenosis and disc herniation. In stenosis, it can be bilateral leg symptoms. In disc herniation, it's always unilateral symptoms. In stenosis, the pain is non-specific. It can be in one buttock, in two buttocks, it can be in one leg, it can be in two legs. So in stenosis, there is bilateral leg symptoms. In disc herniation, there's always unilateral leg symptoms. Pain in stenosis does not go below the knee. In the disc, it is unilateral pain according to dermatomal pain pattern depending on the nerve that's affected by the herniated disc. If the condition affects L5 nerve root due to a posterolateral disc herniation at L4, L5, the patient will have decreased sensation at the top of the foot and weakness of the extensor hallucis longus muscle. In the disc herniation, there is always a positive straight leg raise in stenosis, rarely the patient will have a positive straight leg raise. Diagnosis of lumbar stenosis basically depends on the history. The physical examination does not show much. History is the key in making the diagnosis for a spinal stenosis. The pain is worse with standing or walking and is relieved by rest or setting or by flexing the spine. The pain is variable. It can be in one leg, it can be bilateral, and the pain will be relieved when the patient stops and sits down. Clearly, the leg symptoms and not the back pain will point towards lumbar stenosis, especially if the patient has buttock pain. The most common finding is decrease lumbar lordosis and painful extension of the spine. In lumbar stenosis, the shopping cart sign is helpful because it relieves the pressure on the nerve roots. In lumbar stenosis, the patient will have back pain and stiffness. A neural exam is usually normal in about 50% of the time. If you suspect lumbar stenosis, always examine the pulses and compare both sides. In neurogenic claudication, which is heaviness and cramping of the calves, the patient will walk certain distance, then he gets the pain, then he have to stop and sit down and the pain will go away and the patient resume walking again. This neurogenic claudication is seen in about 50% of the patients. When the patient stands for a long time, the hyperextension of the spine makes the pain worse and flexion improves the pain. So either the patient will sit down or the patient will use the grocery cart to bend the spine and relieve the pain because flexion will increase the size of the neural foramen and also will increase the space for the thecal sac. Another differentiation is vascular disease. The pain starts distal because there's not enough blood going distal and go to proximal because the circulation is porous distally and the reverse occurs in spinal stenosis. Vascular and neurogenic radication may coexist. In vascular claudication, the patient will feel better if the patient stops and stands. So not moving the legs, not moving the muscle, relieves the pain. In vascular claudication, the shopping cart sign is not helpful. Flexing the spine is not helpful because the problem is not the spine. The problem is in the circulation and in the muscle movement.
In vascular claudication, the patient can only walk a predictable certain distance. Then they have to stop. Examination of the pulses on both feet should be done routinely. Pulses is normal in neurogenic claudication, may be abnormal in vascular claudication. Vascular changes in the lower extremity may be present in the form of an ulcer, hair loss, edema, or skin changes. Postural changes improve neurogenic claudication. It does not improve vascular claudication. Standing causes pain for both. Sitting relieves pain in both. Walking upright causes symptoms for both. Standing stationary causes symptoms in neurogenic claudication, but relieves the symptoms in vascular claudication. If you do a stationary bike, the back will be flexed, so it relieves the symptoms in neurogenic claudication, but you use the muscles, and the muscles got ischemia, so it causes symptoms for the vascular claudication. Thank you very much. I hope that was helpful.